The scripture reading for this morning comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, 6, verses 10 through 17, the armor of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, <clears throat> but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. <clears throat> Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evils come, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The word of God for the people of God. We are bit by bit over the next several weeks working ourselves through this text and looking at the various pieces that make up this armor of God that Paul talks about and refers to in the scriptures there. And um, we talked about the first one last week, which was the belt of truth, and this week we're talking about this breastplate of righteousness. And when we talk about righteousness and the term righteousness, all we're really doing is, re is referring to what is for us right action. What is for us the right thing to do? And you know, this week I had a couple of random, powerful illustrations of how our actions impact the lives of those who are around us. And for better or for worse, but the fact that we don't live in isolation. We are touched by others and what we do touches others and makes a huge difference there. One of the things that happened this week when one of the evenings I was at vacation Bible school early in the week, and we referred to it earlier in our concerns, um, I had an unexpected connection with the family of uh, the individuals who drowned in uh, the Mississippi River at Grand Tower. One of the family members was here and they were needing some assistance to be here and, and to stay here while they were doing the search. And uh, he was a brother of the, of the older man who died, and uh, the, the boy was his nephew. And, and um, as he talked about that experience and shared that, it was just one of those illustrations about the fact that sometimes how the actions we make and the judgments we make, whether those are good or bad, have a powerful influence upon our lives, and sometimes they're tragic, the outcomes that are a part of those. And um, things that we don't mean, things that we don't intend, but just things that happen in our world and in our lives. And I contrasted that experience with another experience that I heard about a few days later on... Uh, National Public Radio, the television or the, the radio show All Things Considered was talking about this experience that happened in Florida off a beach in Florida where there was a family down there and there was a couple little boys that were swimming out um, off the beach and they got caught in a riptide and uh, they began to uh, call out for help and, and they became frightened and began to cry and, and uh in response to that, of course, the mother dove in the water and swam out to him, and the grandmother then dove in the water and swam out, swam out there. And by the time uh, it was oh, by the time it was kind of developing, nine people were out there now caught in this riptide, and none of them could get back. And there was this large group of people who had gathered on the shore watching this whole thing unfold, and almost spontaneously. Um, these people began to form a human chain to work their way out from the beach out toward these individuals who were struggling out there in the water and who were caught in this riptide. And uh, 80 different individuals 
most of them complete strangers that they'd never met before. They were just on the beach together that day, the only thing they had in common. Eighty strangers joined hands and arms together to form a human chain that was over 100 yards long so they could stretch out across this area and get to these individuals. The last person in that chain was a young woman by the name of Jessica Simon, and she was the one who was being interviewed on, uh, on the program. And she talked about you know, working her way out along this and getting to the very end and being almost to them and swimming out to them. And she had one of these little boogie boards, and she would use that to ferry them back and going back and forth. And, um, and when it was over, this group of 80 individuals, random individuals on the beach, had saved all nine of them even though the grandmother had actually suffered a heart attack in the attempt to, to be out there and to do this. But they got them all. They, they, they rescued all nine of them and brought them back. And she said, as they kind of walked out of the water back up to the shore, it was one of those experiences where somebody began to clap and somebody began to shout, and there was this great celebration that went up over kind of what they had done. And, and uh, then she said they hung around for just a moment, and then everybody kind of broke up and they went back to their own lives, their own families, their own people who had gathered there with them on the beach. And the commentator asked an interesting question of her. And the question was, how in the world do 80 people who don't know each other suddenly become this unit that works together to save the lives of these people? And her response was interesting. She just said, well, as it developed, everyone just realized it was the right thing to do. And nobody talked about it. It just, it was the right thing, and everyone just understood it, and they did it. The Apostle Paul, as he's writing here in the book of Ephesians to the Christians who were worshiping the communities of Ephesus, pulls on that power there in understanding that and bringing that in as one of the components to what it means to have right action in our world and in our life, to do the right thing when we have an opportunity to do it. That, that doing the right thing offers us certain protections that are always a part of that and accompany that. He attaches this term to the breastplate, and if the breastplate is simply a piece of metal that covers the main part of your body, and it covers vital organs, it covers your heart, it covers your lungs, it covers those kind of things where if you were injured in that area, it would probably be a mortal injury, you would probably die from it. But the breastplate is simply there to protect that in the, midst of, in the midst of conflict, in the midst of battle. And what Paul is saying is, when you and I engage in right action, in right activity, we form a protection around us. We form an armor around us. Let me say it a different way that may help us understand it better. When was the last time you were ashamed of doing what you believe was the right thing. I don't think I've ever been ashamed in my life of doing what I believe was the right thing to do. When was the last time you were embarrassed about doing what you believed was the right thing? Whether it was right or not, in the long run, we never know for sure up front. But at the time you did it, you believed it was the right thing. When was the last time you were embarrassed by that? I don't have a memory of that. I don't ever remember being embarrassed by doing what I thought was right. This is what Paul is pulling on. This is what Paul is pointing to. That when you and I do what we believe is the right thing to do, it is always defendable. There was always a reason for that. There was always a response to be made in that. You don't have to cower in a corner someplace hoping nobody ever brings that up or asks you about that or points that out. Because you did it thinking, believing that it was the right thing to do. Now, 
That doesn't mean you won't get criticized for being and doing the right thing. It doesn't mean that it won't be awkward. It doesn't mean that it's not going to be hard or difficult or challenging. It doesn't mean that even you're not going to be misunderstood about it. But even with all of those outcomes that can be a part of it, at the bottom line, at the end of it, what we understand is still, I have this basic understanding, this basic knowledge that what I have tried to do was what I believed was the right thing to do. And that's always defendable. That's always protected in a certain way and to a certain degree. Years and years ago when I was a boy and we moved down to Southern Illinois from Peoria, I worked with my Uncle Cliff Bishop and, and um, he was building an addition onto the mobile home we were living in and he was building it and my brother and I were mostly in the way probably, but we were supposed to be helping. And he taught me this little saying and I've, learned, I've known it for 50 years the rest of my life and it says, if a job is first begun, do not leave it till it's, till it's done. Be the labor big or small. Do it right or not at all. And that builds on that sense of that. If whatever you do, you do it right. You do it to the best of your ability. You do it the best way you possibly can. Then even if it doesn't turn out right, even if it's not the best, even if it's not perfect, it's still okay. Because I did it right. I did it to the best of my ability. Now, if you're like me, sometimes it's hard to know what's right. And I think sometimes knowing the right thing can be difficult. Sometimes we'll get it wrong. But the Bible gives us a lot of clues, a lot of guidelines about what are the right things from the perspective of God. Paul writes about this later in the book of Philippians. And he says this, and this is a favorite of mine, and it, it's, for me it's really helpful in trying sometimes to look at life and saying, what's the right thing to do? Paul writes this, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, Whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. And what Paul is saying, if you're trying to decide, if you're getting in a situation, you're trying to look at what's the right thing to do, he lays out some criteria. He says, is it true? Is it honest? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Is it admirable? Is it excellent? Is it praiseworthy? That these are all the criteria that you and I can use each and every day to look at the situations that invade your world and mine and try to determine what is the right course in the midst of this. Last week I talked about the belt of truth. I talked about truth and I talked about honesty. And I think after only two weeks, you can begin to see a shape that is beginning to take place here. And it is this, that if you live a life that pursues truth and honesty, if honesty is really important, if, if being honest and truthful is really important and what matters, and you couple that with a commitment to try to do the right thing, to always do the right thing? Do you see the character that you're beginning to build? The integrity that you're beginning to posture? A person who is honest, who pursues to the best of their ability doing what is right as they understand it and as they act on it. Just those two characteristics alone begin to shape and mold a life that has impact, that has purpose, that touches the lives of the people around it in positive and fruitful ways. 
that becomes a power in the world, a power for God and a power for good. The belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness, just those two together can radically shape a life. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, Lord, thank you for the day. Lord, we don't always know what's right. And you know that about us. But you also know our hearts. And you know when we try to do right. Even though sometimes, Lord, it may not work out. Gracious and loving God, Lord, we just pray that you would speak into our lives and speak into our world. Lord, we pray that you would help us to pursue these things in our lives, truth and righteousness, that we might be a force for you in the world. In your name we pray. Amen.